Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We have been celebrating Easter now for four weeks. And we have celebrated the Easter triumph and the Easter joy of our Lord's resurrection. But we realize, as the church did very early on, that the imminent return of Jesus Christ was not going to be as soon as they expected. That they were going to have to do a lot of cross-bearing and a lot of waiting. And readings like this one, those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. To passages like these, they would go as they waited expectantly for the return of Christ. In the church's wisdom, guided by the Spirit, I believe it is for this very purpose that on this Sunday, one that I would say is the hinge of Easter, because we have celebrated the joy of Easter morning and the empty tomb and, what, and, the, and Jesus appearing to Mary. The Lord's appearances on that day, though in church we did not celebrate it, you should yet, you should know that the Lord appeared to the Emmaus disciples. And that little short journey for seven miles, they walked with the Lord not knowing the entire time that it was him. But in the breaking of the bread, it was revealed to them that, that it was the Lord that they had been talking to the entire time. And they returned that very day to the disciples, who would soon be apostles, to tell them of their, to tell them of their experience. And then the Lord appeared to them, showing him his hands and his feet and his side, and declaring the forgiveness of sins to them not once but twice. Peace be with you. And then we celebrated the confession of St. Thomas, who unashamedly declared his unbelief that unless he saw the Lord, he put his finger in the mark of the nails and placed his hands in his side, he would never believe. And his confession, my Lord and my God, showed that, that the Lord's command to not disbelieve, but believe, had been found in his heart. But here we are, all of us, gathered in the church, blessed to have not seen and yet believed. We have celebrated the reality of that, that Christ has brought us in to his sheepfold of the church. He's guided us to the living waters of our baptism that in the pastures of Mount Zion, he feeds us with his holy word and with himself on the altar. We celebrate that his voice has called us and it is that voice of comfort that the church invites us to listen to today as we are called once again to shout for joy, songs of jubilation. In the midst of our waiting, we will have sorrow. We who are on this side of Christ's cross and his resurrection cannot fully know yet the joy and the experience that it was to see Jesus in his resurrected flesh. Though we have the joy that he is alive and we have faith in it, we do not yet see him as he is. And we wait for it. The disciples were distraught and sorrowful because Jesus was telling them that he was leaving. And in a way, I think it's trying to say, what, without getting into details, a, a little while, and you will see me no longer. And again, a little while, and you will see me. Of course, we know that that is Jesus' passion 
and it would be just a little while, not much longer, and he would be taken from them. And he tells them the sorrow that they will have and how the world will rejoice. And they would have sorrow for having witnessed the injustice of it all, the mockery of the trials that he would experience, the choice of Barabbas over Jesus, the shameful acts of their leadership who should have welcomed Christ but rejected him and manipulated the crowds to witness Pontius Pilate washing his hands of the entire situation and allowing Jesus to suffer, flogging him and then delivering him over to be crucified by the soldiers that he had charge of. They witnessed Christ nailed to a tree. They saw it all. But their sorrow is not for merely for what they saw, but their sorrow is for their own shame, their own failings. How in order to save their own skin, they abandoned Jesus. And Peter himself, we know of how he wept bitterly for fulfilling what Jesus said would happen and what he would do, denying the Lord three times. Full of sorrow and grief, distraught probably to the point where they could cry no longer. Their hopes and dreams dashed. They shouldn't have been. Christ told them what would happen. Christ told them that he's going to go to Jerusalem and suffer and die, but on the third day rise. And now he's telling them, you know, in a little while, you're not going to see me, but in a little while you will see me. I'm going to come back. And he relates this to them. A very common experience that, that only half of humanity even has the opportunity to experience, but not even all of them. What women go through. This pregnancy goes on and knowing when you're due, what's coming. The pain, the anguish, the experience of the whole thing is just, as someone who didn't experience it myself, in some ways rather horrific. But then, afterwards, and purely as a witness, to see when that baby is placed upon the chest, upon the breasts of his mother or her mother, and the joy the expression of happiness. What Jesus says is true. Of course it's true. Smiles. It's a beautiful thing. And this is what Jesus is telling them it will be like. But I would say it's even more ecstatic, even than that. He tells them, you will have sorrow now but I will see you again and your hearts will rejoice and no one will take your joy from you. We can't know fully that joy yet. We will know it in the resurrection. And though these words, a little while and you will see me no longer, and again, a little while we cannot fully relate to, we can relate to and we should cling to the a little while and you will see me. In this life, we will have tribulation. We will have sorrow. There will be pain and there will be grief. Not only because of the, the rejoicing of the world as she persecutes the church. But 
but because of our own sins. Sins that we commit against one another. Sins that are committed against us. And even the sorrow that we have for having inflicted pain and suffering upon someone else. It's a sorrowful thing, our state in this world. To the point where people could even grieve to wonder where God is. Where are you, Lord? Where are you in my suffering? And the saints cry out from under the altar, How long, O Lord? And we cry out from this earth, How much longer, Lord? And this is not an experience that that is exclusive to us. This is an experience of those who have been believers since the very beginning. Desire for the restoration of how things should be. Perfect. Perfect in love, without sin, in a paradise. To be with God. In the Old Testament, Jacob, Israel, the people of God, would cry out and wonder, don't you see me, Lord? Can't you see what I'm going through? Why is my way hidden from the Lord and my right disregarded by God? Why do you say that? Is God's, God's word to them. Don't you know who I am? I'm the creator of all things. I call forth the stars, every one of them, every night. And they come out and they process across the sky. Not one is missing. That's what he's talking about. Lift up your eyes on high to the heavens and see those stars. And he says to them, have you not known, have you not heard? It's a call to them to understand that their God is the creator and that he sees their suffering, he sees their plight, and I tell you that he sees yours, even though you may be tempted to cry out something similar. Where are you, God? Why do you let suffering to come into this world? Or why is this happening to me? God knows your pain and your suffering. And this is not merely a knowledge that he has as God, but this is a knowledge that he knows because he is one who, according to his divine power, saw fit as creator to become creature to know intimately our experience as a human being. He knows our sorrows. He knows our griefs. He knows our pain. He knows this life. He knows what you go through. He knows the injustice of this life and the unrighteousness that is here. Our God in his infinite wisdom in his love established a plan through that through his own work to relieve our suffering to wipe the slate clean now some would argue that he could have just done that oh it's okay I'll just make it all go away and declare an absolution. That would be all too easy. In fact, that would be unjust. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. He came to that moment, and in a little while he suffered. Because without his flesh suffering and dying, there would be no peace, there would be no forgiveness, there would be no hope. 
and we would be utterly lost with no hope of paradise. God in his infinite love and wisdom has seen our plight. Now some would argue, well, God has bigger fish to fry than to deal with my problems. He knows your problems. He who governs the stars and the universe, he governs the lives of this world. And as a text that is not in our lesson for today, but one that will be preached on later on this year, I will draw on it today. God, he takes care of the birds, the ravens, the sparrows, robins, the bluebirds, the cardinals, and they go about their lives without a care in the world, singing for joy. And Jesus asks us to consider them. He also invites us to consider the lilies of the field. That field and grass is less important, we would think, in our, according to our estimation, even than the birds. And yet he clothes them with the flowers of the field, with the beautiful raiment of his creation. He takes care of the field, of the flowers, of the birds, of all creatures. And they are insignificant. He takes care of the entire universe, but he also takes care of the needs of the most insignificant. And I tell you, you are not insignificant. You are one who's created in the image and likeness of God. And for you, Christ became creature to suffer and die for you so that you might know the joy of paradise, so that you might know the joy of what life should be a life with God, a life without sin, a life without sorrow, a life without pain and suffering, a life in the new heaven and the new earth. We need to hear of this as we sojourn and as we journey as exiles because it will be just a little while. In less than 10 years, it will have been 2,000 years since our Lord departed. But for God, that's nothing in the span of eternity. For us in the church, it feels like an awful long time. So whether it is in our life on this earth that the Lord returns, or whether it is from our graves that we are called, it will be but a little while. Take heart and comfort as you journey. Take heart and comfort in the sins that Christ paid for on the cross and know that no matter what you face in this life, Christ himself has faced it. No matter how great your sins may be, Christ died for them all so that you might be set free, and you are. The joy of heaven is yours in Christ. So I tell you on this Sunday, and all the Sundays of the church here, as best as you can, do not let your joy decrease, but let each Sunday be as they are intended to be, a little Easter, day of celebrating our life in Christ, his resurrection from the dead, knowing that what stands before us is, is the glory of heaven, the very face of our Savior, who shall be as it is for each of us, like the joy of seeing a newborn baby for the first time, the joyous face of our God, who shall reach forth with his hand, Touch our cheeks and wipe away the tears of joy that we shall have, having beheld the face of God, the God who has loved us and who has forgiven us with his own blood. To Christ be all the glory forevermore. Amen.